So I'm a psychiatrist and uh, I was trained in the UK and went to work in the National Health Service in the UK. And um, one, I used to work in South London and I used to work in an area where there are lots of people who are African and Caribbean origin just like me. And I would be seeing people come to clinic all of the time. And uh, they'd come to clinic and we would work with them. We would often get rid of the symptoms that they were complaining of. And then a few weeks later, they'd be back. And we'd keep on doing this and they'd keep on coming back and keep on doing this and they'd keep on coming back. And I started to think, um, because uh, this was in the uh, 1980s and I think MASH was still on TV about uh, the Vietnam War. And I started thinking, this is like being a psychiatrist in the Vietnam War. I'm, people are coming in, they're coming in psychologically injured and I'm treating them and then I'm putting them right back out there and when I put them out there, they come back. And that's because the things that were uh, upsetting them were the social situations that they were in, unemployment, it was housing, uh, it was finding um, sort of a partner, it was money, it was poverty, it was all of the things uh, that I wasn't able to do anything about. And so I, was, I started getting frustrated and I started thinking, you know, maybe there's something more I can do rather than just treating people. Perhaps I can do other things like I can make um, other support services in the community. So I then got involved in developing alternative types of services in the community. And one of them uh, I was involved in was Antenna, which was a service for young black men, uh, which took a community-based approach to helping outcomes. Instead of trying to treat people's mental health problems, the whole focus of that mental health service that was paid for by the National Health Service in the UK was to get people into jobs or get them into uh, or get them into education, which is revolutionary at that time for a mental health service. So I got involved in that, but I still found that the problems were too big. So you know, I could treat people one by one. I could try and help and support in the social uh, situation, but still the problems were too big. And so eventually, and it's taken some time, but you know, I've been qualified now for nearly 30 years, uh, I got into working on the social factors uh, and the social determinants of health, but at a government level. And so I started working with government and not just uh, on the social determinants of health uh, for um, people with mental health problems, but in general. And so I now am the CEO of Wellesley Institute. And what the Wellesley Institute tries to do is to improve health and health equity in the Greater Toronto Area, in Ontario, in Canada, through developing new policies and convincing the government to uh, set up new policies on the social determinants of health. So it's been a long journey from a uh, feeling that I, my calling was to try and help people face to face to saying, well, maybe I need to work to try and make people's lives better uh, rather than treat the symptoms of their distress. If you look back even to uh, the 19th century, when you look at the sociologist Durkheim, he was interested in suicide and he was talking about um, the social factors uh, that led to suicide. If you look in the 30s, um, there were the people in the Chicago, the Chicago group, who was looking at social disorganization and social disorganization being important not only for the rates of mental health problems but your chances of getting better. And then if you look in the 70s there were movements which were interested in um, you know, the environment and the social environment. Um, there have always been psychiatrists who've been interested in the social environment that they've just never taken control of psychiatry. 
And when we got to the 1990s, which they call the decade of the brain, um, and more and more treatments and more and more uh, people doing um, scans of the brain and other biological, um, you know, uh, biological uh, tests, um, more and more the social was pushed out. There are other things happening. And the rise of this idea of epigenetics, the idea that genes can be switched on and switched off, guess what by? The environment has started even some of the most dyed-in-the-wool biologists saying, hey, there's something happening in the social environment that we need to be able to think about and understand. So, um, you know, to stay in psychiatry all of this time, you have to be an optimist. But I'm optimistic that uh, more and more people are getting interested in the social environment. I don't know they've gone as far as me and said you have to get more involved in uh, politics and government. But I think that, uh, uh, I hope that the tide is turning and people realizing, yeah, we do need to understand individuals, and, uh, but we really un need to understand communities. I think that um, you just depends on who you think your peer group are. If you believe your peer group is just other psychiatrists, um, then you're in the minority. Um, but the truth is, when you look in society, people who think like psychiatrists are the minority. And people who think like human beings about how society runs are the majority. So you can be isolated in your own profession, or you can be in the minority in your own profession. And at the same time, you can come to conferences like this and realize that you've got more in common with uh, more people uh, out there than just psychiatrists.